Today's episode is a part of Retention Club, a new series of episodes on retention and re-engagement, which we have co-produced with our friends at Addictive. In this series, we dive deep into the heart of what keeps users returning for more and continuing to engage with products, retention. Each episode dissects latest strategies, insights, and tactics from some of the smartest marketers and developers in the world. And each episode dives into how they use these strategies and tactics to build lasting relationships with their users, to improve the retention of their products and thereby drive growth. Our guest today is Sharat Kolegi, marketing manager at Dino Games, who has worked with user acquisition, product management and ad monetization for over 50 games. Yes, you heard that right, over 50 games. He's worked with market-defining gaming studios, including Tactile Games, Game House, and many others. And today, I'm excited to dive into Sharad's perspectives on very early retention, particularly day zero, the components of winning day zero, and how that translates into downstream retention and overall growth. For this very in-depth, deep dive into retention, I'm excited to welcome Sharat. I'm very excited to welcome back Sharat Kaulegi to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Sharat, welcome to the show. Thanks, Shaman. I hope you don't mind much like last time. My cat might get crashed this call. Your cat certainly crashes a lot of our calls that we've had together over the last 10 years. Yeah. Suddenly she's been a steady presence for that Indeed. because that's long we've how that's how long we've known each other. Yes. And to introduce you to folks, shout out you manage marketing at Dino Games, prior to which you were the head of user acquisition at Tactile Games and you were a product manager for ad monetization at Game House. Yep. And of course, in the course of your career, you've worked with over fifty games and you really know and understand all things user acquisition and product and monetization, which is a very rare combination among the folks that I know and I've met and interacted with. So for all of those reasons, I'm excited to have you back on the show. Certainly we talk quite a bit, but it's good to sort of have this be sort of officially recorded. Thank you for that kind introduction. I wouldn't say that I understand everything. I certainly try, uh, but that's not the same thing. So to get started, you have worked with apps at very different stages of their growth. Yep. You've worked with apps that are in multiple millions in spend and audience, and also with apps that are relatively small. For the apps that are relatively small, why do you focus on retention rather than monetization? Given obviously monetization matters to some extent, but I get the impression that retention is a primary focus. So why is that the case? It's a very different challenge taking something from a PowerPoint presentation or a document into the first APK and then have something that people engage with. And, and I focus a lot on consumer apps, mainly games. And right now, especially in this environment, there's nothing that I think investors and, and teams would like more than having something that monetizes. I get where that comes from and you could do that. I'm a bit traditional that way. I think that's very much putting the cart before the horse. You could do premium games if you really want to test whether you're in a segment that monetizes and you could do paywall games. There are uh, definitely stable niches there uh, and hyper casual isn't dead. So you could also put 50 ads uh, on day zero, but the likelihood of growing a game that way, um, let alone a company, um, that is diminishing. And it's almost back to full circle. When you and I were first doing user acquisition way back in 20. 11, 2012, 2013, days before the MMPs when tracking wasn't super great. We're kind of in that situation now where tracking isn't super great, going to get worse on the major platforms. Fine from a consumer point of view because it affords some sense of privacy, but it puts a lot of pressure on game makers because it's harder and harder to find this super niche 3 to 5% that tends to monetize. So you want to build something that has the ability to keep people in for a longer time. There are a lot more games out there. So a good way to do that is to separate yourself from the pack, so to speak, is to focus properly on quality. Games, especially with day zero, 
there are so many moving parts. It's one of my secret theories as to why I think multiple game hits are so much harder than, say, multiple movie hits. Not that that's easy. Uh, you spend a lot of time writing, so you know about the sophomore curse and all of those things. While those are very real challenges in other forms of entertainment, with games, it's just so much harder because you have multiple moving parts. Uh, just focusing on retention reduces the number of ways you can go wrong. And there are so many ways to go wrong with games. I, I really do think that retention is the one continuing North Star for good game development. I agree with what you said about there being many ways to go wrong. Some of those can be redeemed by retention because I worked on a very popular, almost household name game for a publicly traded company. And the early monetization was terrible, but their year two retention was very Fantastic. close to 10%, which meant they didn't really need to monetize people in year one. <laughs> yeah, They did obviously monetize to some extent, but they didn't need to be profitable with user acquisition. And they were like, yeah, we we'll lose money in year one on user acquisition because we will make money in year two and year three and beyond. You can go a lot more easy with monetization if your retention is strong. Granted, that was a very extreme situation. That kind of retention is very difficult to attain. Well, we can talk about why that was the case, but certainly retention can redeem monetization among other things. It's very difficult to also do monetization. It's not like that's easy either. Retention, because yeah. of what it actually represents. People are always on a finite resource when it comes to time. With money, it's, it's a slightly different thing. Amongst the million games out there in the App Store, even before you've really figured out the entire game, because the assumption is that if you haven't figured out monetization, your game isn't properly done, uh, which is a fair assumption. Before that, if you're already seeing strong retention signals, it means you're doing something right, because they could be playing any of the other million games. Yeah. I know that this is going to sound bad, but anybody who has two years of retention and is unable to monetize should be able to solve that problem eventually. Now it's a much more urgent problem because cost of cash is much more real than it was a few years ago. The two-year LTV projection is a bit rare, and I think it takes someone really yeah. brave right now to do user acquisition on day 720. It's not like those folks aren't out there, but who knows what yeah be like in 2026. You briefly mentioned the zero metrics. Yep. You are among the few people I know that actually speaks about and focuses on day zero metrics. It's just day zero retention and uh, intraday zero retention too. Talk to me about intraday zero retention metrics, why these are important. I, I got into looking at games from the marketing side. And I remember when I was with a dozen soft launches I kept saying, get day one retention to 50%, get day seven to 20, and then get day 30 to 10, like everybody used to eight, 10 years ago. And then I got into the other side of it with product. And suddenly I realized how that was not very useful as input for marketing. The obvious question then is, okay, so how? Day one is the child of, of day zero behavior. It's also a little bit easier to really focus on the day of install both in terms of delays and in terms of how much coordination there can be between product and marketing. Then there's the fact that games are three things all at the same time. There's the core loop, there's the meta loop, and then there's just the software stability of it after you get past the initial install. There's also things like the art theme and everything, but hopefully you've solved that problem with user acquisition because some art skins will have $5 CPIs and others will have $2 CPIs and that's also a thing and you have to be careful about that. But once you've solved that problem, you have to look at the game. And if you have consistently day one retention of 25, 24%, you're in this zone of where your game isn't terrible. So it's not like no one's coming back, but it's also far from viable because you're definitely not hitting any profitability metrics at that point, even if you monetize right away and the cat agrees. So then what do you do? A lot of the time I find marketing is stuck, design is stuck. And then you dig a little bit deeper and you see that quite often there are session two problems. So the game either has a session one problem, which means your software doesn't load <laughs> or yeah. you know, the game is completely unintelligible, or it has a session two problem where we just haven't made an impression on the user. There's no reason for them to return. 
to the game. We yeah. promised them something in the ad. We gave them something in the software that we think is close and that we think is cool. And yet they won't even come back a second time when they're opening their phone 40, 50, 60, 100 times a day. That's a tough signal to read. And I do find that the biggest improvements to be had are right at the top of the funnel. For me, that day zero metric of getting 30 minutes to 45 minutes on the day of install, that's very clearly the mark of a good game. It's also the mark of a game that tends to get a lot of organic traction. Back in the day, there used to be this thing called which was get six sessions a day for six minutes for six months and you've got a good mobile game on your hands. I don't know if that number is valid anymore about the six and the six, but getting 30 minutes or more in day zero as a median play time, that's very much a thing. And that's very much something that we want to be doing with any of the new products because that will give a good indication on day one. I've seen very few games that have good day ones I've worked on like about 50 release products, but I've worked on hundreds of prototypes. And some of those we went through together after a giant hit, then there's the next game, which suddenly, forget about a giant hit, is just not even a game and then gets pulled because we aren't able to solve day one. That quite often happens because there is a session two problem. There is a day zero engagement problem. There's huge drop-offs in the first 10 minutes, let alone day one of, of people coming back. I do find that day zero is hugely actionable. It's also something that can be tested a lot cheaper. Right now in the world of Sensor Tower and their detailed analyses for some of these things for benchmarking, even though it's not precise to the last decimal point, I don't think any business intelligence tool can be that. I think it gives a good sense of specific benchmarks within subgenres. I like the fact that we have a broad-ish map for day zero behavior, and then we can take that and start tuning the game and do rapid iterations. And that saves a lot of time. It also tells you when there are games that we don't know necessarily how to save, and then you have to move on. I do enjoy working with day zero metrics a lot more because it's just a lot more fruitful than saying, I just hit the benchmarks for day one and day seven. I liked how you talked about, you know, you have to get the session two, right? Session one, it's somewhat easy to fix if you fix the software, right? You can yeah. get it through a reasonably good ad. Even if a terrible ad, you can get session one. Yeah. If a software is working, session two, are they coming back? Because there's nothing to bring them back in. We'll talk about some of the retargeting that you could do, but that wouldn't happen in session two. That's a good mark of are they engaging? And that's a, always a good sign. And are they, if they're spending 30 minutes, clearly there's something they're liking. There's something they're enjoying and kind of like the game with the two-year retention. If they're playing for 30 minutes, there has to be some way to figure out how to expand on those 30 minutes. To go past day zero, what are some of the things that influence early retention past day zero? You have one session two, you have one D zero, there's D1, D7 and beyond. What are some of the factors that influence the retention numbers after that? This is pretty much where product and and you really have to become good friends. And it's not good to necessarily have people who are not invested in it. I, I wouldn't, for example, even treat them as two different teams. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily have a, a separate data team. Like I would put them all within the same pod, if you will, to just make the game not suck. <laughs> it's very easy to, to say that the game sucks and you have a low CPI. And this is the happiest thing for marketing because you have low CPI. But then if the retention is terrible and there is a huge disconnect between the product and, and marketing, if we have great CPIs, and it's not necessarily that people set out to do fake ads. Sometimes things work out that way if you're not coordinating properly. And if you have a great CPI and you have a terrible day one, day seven, you might want to look at, hey, should we actually include the ad experience in the game? And that has worked quite a number of times where you have an ad that has a low CPI that's kind of related to the game, but you don't actually see the mechanics in the ad play out in the game. It's a bit of a tail wagging dog situation if it's not something that everybody has buying on from the beginning. If everybody is the same pod or the same tiny team, then you don't have the situation where, oh, but we're changing the game because of the ad, which always feels like a bad thing. But suddenly when it's framed as oh, we have product marketing research or product research that says people are responding to this visual or people yeah. are responding to this mechanic. That's a very different conversation, even though yeah. in substance, it's the same conversation. 
and people are feeling machines that happen to think and it's important to take that framing into context when these things are edited or when these experiments are being designed. For day one, day seven, it's surprising how ads can actually, the kind of traffic you get does obviously influence it. And even if it's the same channel, the same targeting, a different creative will definitely impact day one. Recently, I saw something that I found really hard to believe where a difference in creative, which was not a fake ad by any means, was much closer to the most boring part of gameplay than we saw 10, 20 points lift in day one retention. Those are things that happen. And day seven and onwards, it it's really comes down to, are we meeting the core needs of the user? And that's something that is much more pure design. Are you making that kind of impact? And is the story of the game the same as the story of the ad, for example, um, which yeah. I have a huge love-hate relationship with because... The moment you put in a story in the game, you have three moving parts at the same time. And then everybody thinks that the part that they influence is, is the most important. For marketing teams, it's the ad. For the narrative design team, no, it's a story. And then for the pure game design, it's the mechanic. And the thing is, all three of those things have to work for you to get day seven right. And yeah. that's really hard. It's very hard to first evolve internal consensus and then for the market to actually care about that internal consensus. <laughs> And very often you end up splitting the difference and then you create a bad story, a weird mechanic and, and an ad that has just kind of okay CPI. And that's how a lot of games die in prototype phase, unfortunately, or they get to the market and then don't make an impact because of those kind of suboptimal compromises, which the market hasn't validated. It's very often a tough negotiation to get to those things. Yeah. If you can get further retention going, and if you can bring people back on the hook that matters, whether you're doing it intrinsically, which is the best way to do it, or extrinsically, which is through the local notifications, the re retargeting campaigns, all of those things. Anything that enhances the day one almost always impacts day seven. So there isn't a perfect time to say that, okay, now I want to bring users back. The perfect time is now. So uh, bring users yeah. back at day zero, at day one, at day three, the weekends, day seven. And sure. every time you do live ops at day 14, uh, I would definitely do all of those things. It's interesting what you mentioned about ads and the traffic sources that have a very disproportionate impact on retention. I was talking to somebody, I think a couple of weeks ago, and this person was like, you know, we were running these ads. We were just measuring D1 ROAS. Our D1 ROAS was amazing. And our retention sucked. So we just thought our game sucks or the ad's great. And we turned off that ad for a little bit of time and our retention improved like crazy, even though our D1 ROAS was worse. It turns out you could have a very good D1 ROAS because of the creative, yeah. but that may not translate into D1 retention, D7 retention and beyond. If someone comes and makes an impulse purchase, maybe buys a startup pack or something, the D1 ROAS is going to be very good. It was also somewhat scary for me to hear because this person could have bet the future of his company based on a single bad ad that actually yep. looked good. So it's, I think, very important to be very, very careful in these regards, which ties into what you said about being mindful of the traffic and traffic sources and the ads themselves as well. That's kind of the stakes that, that we're playing for, especially like in the beginning of the product's life cycle. Yeah. Most gaming companies are not fortunate enough to have infinite runway. A new game is very yeah. often something that you are at least betting a studio on, if not the entire company on. And that's the nature of the industry. It's high risk, high reward. For the last couple of years, tourists joined the industry, especially on the investment side of things. And I think some of them will leave because of the nature of things. It's now harder to build higher quality games. It's very hard to release new games that are successful, that can sustain an entire company. It's not impossible. And the people who want to make games, enjoy making games, are going to still make good games. And I don't think any genre is beyond disruption. I, I really don't. Because the number of times, for example, just with Match 3, I've heard that only to have a new 10-digit player join Immediately yeah. after someone does a really detailed analysis of how this genre is saturated is, is testament to that. It's tough weather, but more good games are coming in, in, in all the genres. To don't have it very easy now. It's uh, tough. Yeah. I sympathize because uh, yeah, it looked yeah, yeah. like 
uh, anyone could come in and, and make a, a really good day zero or day one ROAS, like you said, and then we would have it. And now hyper casual is going through a really, really tough phase. I don't think it's dead by any means. I know a yeah. lot of people do. I do think that yeah. a fraction of those games will survive. I think that part is is clear, that it's, it's definitely yeah. harder. We, we talked about the different stages of retention, D1, D7, and beyond. And you talked about the different factors that contribute to downstream retention. When would you say is the right time to consider re-engagement or retargeting ads? And what are some of the considerations that an app needs to keep in mind for getting retargeting ads right? Whether it's paid or unpaid, we should do retargeting and re-engagement with the users throughout their life cycle with different messaging. On day zero, I definitely want to use something to bring people back for session two. Very often that's an intrinsic game reality thing. So if you're running a, a fashion game, then you know the clothes that you ordered are being delivered. That, that's a, a very natural in-game come back to session two re-engagement. But more and more there's value in engaging people over the old fashioned ways through, through email and, and those kinds of things. Certainly paid ads, especially for a game that has proven itself, it makes a lot of sense to re-engage even at that point, which seems kind of silly. I mean, why would you re-engage at session two? But you're really fighting for people's attention. And if you have a product that you believe in, if you have a product that has the metrics for to justify that belief, I would start even at that point. And then the entire phase of it, which is after day zero, then day one. So session two, day one, day three, Certainly the first weekend post-install, that's a good time to do it. And then of course, before each of the live ops that goes into the game, I would hit all of that. I wouldn't overspend uh, on it. I wouldn't spend crazily. With the removal of some of these mobile identifiers and the quiet resurgence in some of the other platforms like PC, we initially worked on a game, you and I, the first game that we worked on, it was available on PC, it was available on tablets, it was available on phones of all platforms. And I think people kind of misinterpreted mobile first in between the last few years as mobile only. And, and that I think was a mistake because it gave undue uh, control uh, of, of the platforms o over our games. And, and I think now, once again, we're, we're seeing quite resurgence in web and, and those kinds of platforms. And I think it's pretty easy to, to hook all of these things into specific tools, specific platforms, I read somewhere that with AI, there's the possibility of the single person, a unicorn. I would go so far as to say that there's a high chance that that unicorn is a gaming company. One person could do design, development, marketing, acquisition, and re-engagement all at the same time by just coding in these bots for possibly a game that would be pejoratively referred to as, oh, that's just a hyper-casual game. And, and that's a little bit of sour grapes, a little bit of disbelief. We'll see how that goes. Certainly. There's a certain class of games that has consistently put in hundreds of millions of people's time and enjoyment. I, I think that that's very possible. Certainly, that's going to happen if people remain engaged. I don't think it's going to happen with premium games. And, and if I'm wrong, then I'll apologize later. Yeah, sure. This has been great. Thank you for going so deep into all things retention and re-engagement at every stage of an app. Every time we speak, I always learn something. So this has been a great conversation. This is perhaps a good place for us to wrap. But before we do that, can you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? I've uh, recently returned to LinkedIn and social media. <laughs> so, Congratulations. So, and uh, I'm easy to find that way. That will be the easiest way to just ping me on LinkedIn. And... I will. We will link to that in the show notes. But for now... We'll let you carry on. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Sean. Take care. Bye. For more tips, pointers, and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition, subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog.